All right, Michael. Yep. Michael, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from? I am from Queens and Brooklyn, New York. And tell me about your family growing up. Um, well, my mother and dad, they split apart when I was about one. So I was living with my mother and I'll see my dad um, once a week on Saturdays. It was like that until like my earliest memories. And then um, when I was like seven, that's when I was hit by a car in 96. Um, I broke two bones, my left leg, uh, upper leg and lower leg. And I remember getting up because the way New Yorkers are, I was, well, the way it happened was I was slapping my older sister's friend's booties, you know, at seven, yeah. And they started chasing me because I wouldn't listen. So I ran right to the street. I looked at the light, I was turning yellow. And then I looked back and a car slammed past me. So, and it backed over my leg and pulled up. So I got up, tried to walk. I remember thinking like, did that really just happen? And then I was like, be a man, get up and walk, you know? That's kind of like where we come from, uh, growing up with an Italian family, so. And then that was like one of my earliest childhood traumas, I guess, like physically. Um, then by the time I was about eight, my mother was always working, so my older sister and brother watched us and they started getting into like drugs and stuff and not going to school. So it called for like uh, child services and whatnot. And I ended up being taken away to a foster home for like, well, first a group home for like two weeks. And then that's when I started fighting. And then a foster home, I don't remember for how long, for like over six months. Um, and then my grandmother came and got me out and adopted me when I was like nine. And I stayed with her till I was about 13 or 14. I learned to read with her. I didn't learn how to read to the fourth grade or write or anything. Um, but she got this idea to move us out to the projects in East New York. Um, and that was rough, you know? It's hard in the projects if you're a black dude. Can you imagine a white dude with blonde hair and blue eyes? It worked out well for the women, but it didn't work out so well with uh, the dudes, you know? Um, I got into several fights there. Usually people were always older than me because I was a lot bigger than I looked my age. So people were always trying to rob me and whatnot. And I don't star fights, but I never ran from a fight either. I wasn't taught that way growing up, you know? Um, not to start anything, but don't run from anything. So uh, I lived in the projects and uh, that was like my second junior high by that time. My friend, he got shot in the head at 13. Um, he was in the Bronx visiting his grandmother and he looked at some dude uh, who was like 25 and he didn't like how he looked at him. So when he got back in the elevator, they shot him in the head. He died. So I guess. He died? Yeah, he died instantly. Um, I found out when I came back from like Christmas vacation. So it was tough. I was working the whole time, going to school, growing up because we were very poor. Um, which helped me out in a lot of ways, you know, so I wasn't relying on parents and whatnot. And by the time I was like 13, I found out me and my grandmother got into it. She was like trying to stop me from seeing my dad. So I decided to leave and I went with my uncle for a year. And that's where I got into a good high school because I was zoned in East New York for like Thomas Jefferson, which is one of the worst high schools. And I got into Midwood High School, which is like the second best in Brooklyn. So thank God for that. And from there, I was working, going to school, playing football. I ended up moving back to my mother when I was around 14 or 15 years old. Um, by that time, she didn't really try to tell me anything because I was already working, paying for my own stuff, doing my own thing, going to school. And it's good because like now I see it as a blessing because I needed to develop my own personality by being taken away from my family, you know, rather than being taken out of that bubble. So uh, my goal was basically to join the army because I know I couldn't afford college and I needed to get out of where I was at. But by the time I hit 18, my mother called up like Jacoby and Myers lawsuit. I'm not advertising for them, but, uh, and they got me like a good lump sum for, uh, 
when I was 18 from the car accident. Um, I spent that wildly, not knowing what to do with it, bought a car, gambling, drugs, you know? And then I was like, man, I got to stop. I got to get out of here. So my ticket out of that environment was, you know, going to the army. And I knew they were going to pay for college. And I did. So I remember I was like six months late on graduation for like uh, gym credits. Um, I had to negotiate with the athletic director because when I played football, that was on my gym credits. And when I stopped, I didn't want to go to gym class because I thought it was a waste of time. Um, so I had to negotiate with her to actually pass and, you know, to go like four weeks straight to like four classes or something like that and not miss one class. And she'd give me my diploma. And I was like, all right. So as soon as I got that, I went to the recruiter. I was talking to the Marines recruiter. They were in my house. I was trying to decide between airborne or Marines because also when I was 18, I'm afraid of heights. So I went skydiving. That was my first thing I did to get over it. And uh, it was a rush. So I was trying to choose between Ranger or Reconnaissance. And my friend came back from deployment. He's like, don't go to the Marines. He's like, he's like, trust me, it's not worth it. The Army gets promoted faster. So I was like, all right. So that made my decision. I went to the U.S. Army um, with 11 x-ray contract. That's infantry. Um, you could become 11 Bravo, which is foot soldier, or 11 Charlie, which is a mortarman. And in basic... They gave me a RIP contract, which is for Ranger Introduction, Special Operations, because I had the highest PT score. Um, they put me as 11 Charlie MOS, which was a mortarman. Um, but I got hurt in basic, my ankle, and I kept going because I knew what I was going back to if I didn't pass, you know. And then when I was in airborne school, I got hurt again, the same ankle. Um, that was for three weeks. And then I went to the Ranger Introduction program, which was another three weeks of like selection. But in the RIP program, we called it, I hurt my ankle again, and they wouldn't let me wear the ankle brace. So I was like, you know what, I'm done. Just send me to a unit, and they sent me to the 80, uh, 82nd Airborne. I was in the first 504 with the Red Devil unit, and I was about 19 then in 2008. So they were preparing for a deployment um, to Iraq in 2009. So our unit is kind of, it is an elite unit for an airborne unit. So we're always out training and whatnot, like uh, especially during the training cycle. So I was doing like my expert infantry badge, training every day on mortar system, shooting a lot. And then um, I remember I was living in the barracks. Everybody would go out and party and they called me a barracks hermit because I didn't need to. I already did that. I came from that. I was like, so you got to imagine it's like a bunch of college age sorority kids except the difference is they're a bunch of train killers. You know what I mean? So they're going out and partying and spending all their money and drinking. I'm like, nah, bro, I'm good. So that's when I started learning about investing. I got into like stocks. It's like, I'm saving up all this money. What am I going to do with it? You know? So I started buying stuff. I didn't even know what I was doing. And then when I went to Iraq in 2009, we called it the get big deployment. Cause all we were doing were training Iraqi army and shutting down um, fobs. And I was a gunner. I couldn't even do my job in a lead truck. So I just worked out and I read a bunch of books on investing. And that's how I started, like, opening up my mind for different paths, you know. And I did well in the stock market because it was 2008. Everything crashed, you know, so everything was low. My friend, I didn't know what I was doing. So I got, like, the easiest book I could find on economics, which was, like, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. My friend made, like, 80 grand in employment to uh, before from his uh, Wall Street stockbroker. He gave me a tip to buy like Citigroup. So that went well, but I sold it before the time frame that was planned. Because um, in Iraq, I met my ex-wife as well. So uh, they had us on a big fob towards the end of deployment and she was swimming in the swimming pool. And I was learning how to swim, which is ironic, in a desert by a black lifeguard. My friends laugh at that all the time because they say to never swim, but that's not true, you know? So I met her in a pool and um, and we started hitting it off. And when I got back from that deployment, um, I already started feeling like PTSD coming up, you know? I noticed it because um, you're, on hype, you're on hyper alert. Even though I wasn't in combat yet, um, I was a lead gunner. So when you go through cities and whatnot, you got to watch everybody's hands, you know? And the more people, the harder it is, especially when you're a uh, lead truck, you're looking for like bombs on the ground for what's in people's hands, uh, any weapons, cell phones. 
So when I came back to like New York on vacation and I was driving, I noticed like I was driving way slower than everybody and I couldn't like keep up with everybody's hands, you know? So with that, anyway, that's when I noticed that part started stemming up. And um, I ended up going to Hawaii where my ex-wife was, you know, back and forth, getting to know her. And we ended up getting married. She got out and moved to North Carolina with me. And that's when I like bought a house, you know, um, I was 22. I was at a career which my family never had. I was the first person to have a high school diploma, um, first person to have a house, you know. So I was like, and then I was just like, I remember thinking, I was like, now what? I was like, am I going to be like this for 25 years? That's it, you know? So I was looking for more and more. Um, but after the house, I bought that because my unit told us for Afghanistan 2012 that we had a 50% chance of coming back alive. And... 80% uh, chance of losing both our legs. So that's what prompted me to buy the house. So I was like, well, if I get killed, you know, she's probably gonna be too sad to buy a house, so let me buy that. And she could just pay it with the life insurance. So I really didn't expect to come back alive from that deployment, you know? And it was true to their word. We went to Ghazni, Afghanistan, uh, 2012. They even made an episode of My Fighting Season about it. I wasn't in it, but uh, the dudes that were in my unit were. Um, so it was rough, a lot of combat in that. It was like a six month deployment. So I was shot at, sniper fire, machine gun fire, um, blown up with an IED. You know, we found like over nine, 90 IEDs, just my company, and we hit like over 50 of them, you know? So it was a lot of uh, explosions. I had one guy that was shot in the chest um, by 762, he got killed, you know? And another uh, two friends that were blown up, they were killed. Um, so all that made me kind of like wonder, like, why am I still alive? How am I still alive? You know, like, I was in machine gun fire in the open. I heard a sniper bullet pass my head before. Um, I was like, I was blown up in a, by a 100-pound IED, and there was 20 mortar rounds in a truck, and nothing happened. People were like, call me that good luck charm. Um, they wouldn't want to go out with me. They'll show me like photos of where I was at in a firefight and there's like bullet holes all around me. So I was just like, that's when I started thinking that there was a God, you know? I grew up Roman Catholic, but I didn't really believe. It was just the thing Italians do. You know, we go to religious studies. But I was like, is, I was like, how am I this lucky? There's no way, you know? Or we would like pass IEDs and then someone else would find it and then it'll blow it up after we walked over them. So there was a lot of... Uh, like too many close calls. But on that deployment, I also got my first kill, which was like through an ACOG. So it's a times four sight, uh, times four sight on an M4. Um, and the firefight was like within 250 meters. We were ambushed. That was my first firefight. Um, we were like walking through a village and then there was another village and we were funneling and they had an ambush set up for us on the next village. Like they were gonna come down and fire upon us. But the bomb sniffing dog, he had to, uh, he had to actually stop. So, uh, cause every like 30 minutes they could overheat um, cause of the dog's temperature. And the enemy thought we spotted them, but we didn't. And then it was like, I was sitting out in the open as usual, you know? But I looked at for my next point to go to. And I remember specifically, I looked to my left, I see the engineers, we use them to like, you know, dispose of the IEDs um, cause the actual EOD team, they took too long. They'll take robots out and whatnot. Engineers would come and take an incendiary grenade and blow it up. So I was like, oh, they're in cover. I look to my right, I see my commander like in a ditch. I was like, he's in cover. I look at the radio guy who's the commander's radio guy. He's like, I was like, oh, he's not in cover. He's like me. So I was like, I'm cool. And I was eating and then I just looked forward and I seen this dude about two and a half football fields in front of me. Um, he was like over six foot. And his clothes looked brand new, and he had running shoes on. I could see this, and I see him raising something up. And our ROE, rules of engagement, is you cannot fire unless someone is actually pointing at you, ready to engage you. And then I heard from my left, contact, contact, and they started firing. And I heard an RPG, like, fly over my head, but I was still focused on the guy in front of me. And before I knew it, my training kicked in and I was already up and running to the next position while firing at him. And then I seen him firing through my ACOG 
at me. And I remember the first time I got shot at, I was just like, now I know why they got the movie The Matrix, because like everything felt so slow, you know? And then I heard the bullet come close to me and I was just like, I was like, oh, if I get hit, my wife's gonna kill me. My ex-wife at the time, because she's Spanish, you know how, I don't know, but you know, they're feisty. They're like, boom, you know, you got hurt, what's wrong with you? So I end up, I kept saying to myself, two in the chest, one in the head, and like I was running, so I remember his face coming up and down. And every time it came up to down, that's when I fired. Um, and then I made it to the next spot and that guy was gone. So, and as I was pulling up to aim at another dude, my commander was right behind me and he said, throw away your M4, you know, pull out the 60 millimeter mortar. We shot it handheld. So this is an explosion of like, equivalent of like a hand grenade, but it could go further. Um, the radius is about 15 to 35 meters. Um, anywhere in that you could become, you know, get killed or be injured. So. I threw the weapon on the floor, um, and to shoot it, it's like a tube. So you can't be behind a wall. You have to come out of cover. And it's meant to have no bipod legs um, in order for it to go at a lower altitude so you don't have to call battalion for air support. So that's what I did. And my, my rules from the commander was look up, make sure there's no choppers. And I fired. Once I fired, that was it. The enemy ended the fight right there. They booked it, they jumped on their motorcycles, they grabbed their bodies and they were out. So that was like a taste from just the first firefight. And it was many more after that. Um, the day I got hit with an IED, uh, I was in two ambushes. So we went to a place called the playground, what we called the playground at first. It was a Taliban uh, training ground. We called it the playground because every time we went out there, the enemy came out to play. That's what we called it. So um, our one of our companies was doing a major operation somewhere else. Our commander decided to bait us. Um, he was in BUD, so he was actually an ex-SEAL. Um, he decided to go to the Army, become an officer. We called him Captain America. But he, was, he really fought, you know? So he took himself, the RTO, which is the radio guy, to call the other radios in case something happened an FSO, the field officer, to call in for ad strikes, and me, um, the mortar, with the most firepower on the ground. And we actually baited ourselves and walked away from the trucks. And as we were walking, as the RTO was saying something, he's like, oh, they're not going to mess with us. They're effing with, the current, you know, he said that F word. They're effing with Delta Company. And as soon as he said that, they lit us up from three different directions. And we were, like, pinned down. And... Um, of course, they look to me and they're like, get up, fire your mortar, suppress the enemy. And I'm just like, cover me, dude, because there was no cover. The nearest building was like 300 meters in front of us, and it was in the middle of like three different towns. And that's where we're getting hit by all three towns. And our trucks were on a highway one. They couldn't, they couldn't hear us, you know what I mean? Because it's so loud, the trucks and the microphones, you only hear the radio chatter. So the commander was like yelling at the the convoy, you know, shoot the 50s, shoot the 50s. They were yelling at me to get up, and all I hear is the crossfire above me. Um, and I was asking the radio guy to cover me, but he came behind me, kind of, to cover his body. So I was just like, whatever. I just got to the point. You get to the point where you're just like, if I get hit, I get hit, you know? I was saying bad things about the, the commander in my head, you know, calling him Captain America, chasing medals. But, because I was mad, I was angry, and I was in that position. So I got up and I, I was able to fire. No bullets hit me, thank God. Um, and as soon as I fired, it put up smoke, like a screen, you know? Um, enough to cover one side and give us like a, a smoke screen to be able to run to the building. So we got there, they brought the trucks off the road to engage the cities, um, well, the villages, the towns. And they left me at the house while they kept clearing the villages and the firefight was still going on. Uh, Cause I had a lot, I had like 110 pounds of gear on my body. So anyway, by the end of the day, we cleared all the villages. Um, we were completely exhausted. I went to the truck I was supposed to go on, but an NCL took my spot cause he was too tired to walk. So he's like, can't you just take my spot? And I was like, all right, why not? And I said, take my bag, which had my mortar round, um, my mortar tube and my mortar rounds. And I, I gave it to him. I went into his truck. And they were bringing us through the tracks of what they thought were our tracks, but it was from another company. And they put an IED there, and we were in the front. 
So as we're riding, I remember thinking it too. I was just like, man, all of us survived that. And I was like, imagine one of us get blown up on the way back. It was surf and turf night. So I remember it clearly. That's like steak and lobster night on a fob. And I was just like, because we were all excited we are going to make it back. And we didn't. So as we were driving and I thought that, all I seen was a flash. And I felt my body rise up in the ground and then darkness. And then I woke up to uh, the guy next to me because I was leaning like uh, it made a huge ditch in the front. So the truck was up and I was leaning on the guy and he, sh he shook me up like, yo, you all right? You all right? Um, and all of us were fine. And then the, the, the person, uh, the leader in that truck got mad at me for putting my mortar rounds in there. And I was like, yo, you told me to put them in the trucks. You didn't tell me how to. Cause he's like, why is this even in here? How did it not explode? And they were like, it was like a emotional wreck. Like you were surprised to be alive. You couldn't believe it just happened. And then you became super angry because you had to follow this ROE rules of engagement that the enemy didn't follow. You know, like uh, we called them a bunch of cheaters, but whatever. So they gave me a purple heart for that. Um, Cause I had mild traumatic brain injury. Um, next day you wake up, it feels like someone took a shovel and just slapped you in the head with it, you know? And we're supposed to be on like brain rest. I was like, how do you go on brain rest, dude? And I was like, you want me to just like not think? He said, don't watch TV, don't do nothing, don't think. I was like, all right. But three days later, they ended up having us go back out on mission anyway, so. Yeah, that was like Afghanistan. So that place was hell. Um, the unit that replaced us, they didn't listen to us. And in the first month, they had like over 15 dudes killed from the spot we told them to go to. What not to do, including a company commander. My commander told me that. Like after a month we were back. He said they didn't listen to us, you know, left seat, right seat, but they wanted to do it their own way. Usually how people are. So they paid the price for it. Um, so after that, I came back, I was jacked up. Like I remember I came back, I seen my ex-wife and she hugged me and I felt dirty, you know, cause I knew there was blood on my hands and that messed me up. It was hard to cope, you know, I kept seeing like the muzzle flashes or that dude shooting at me and his face and the ACOG. Um, and also, you know, not knowing where all your rounds went, you know, that bothers a lot of people too, because you shoot a lot of rounds, you know, and you can't track every single round. And these people are using villages as cover. That's what they do. They, they use them as cover. And as soon as you have upper hand on them, they drop everything and hide in the villages as the people. So that also messes a lot of people up when they come back because you can never tell who's your enemy and not. So it always has you on guard and crowds and whatnot, even back here. So um, I started taking like painkillers to help me cope. Cause I remember I had like something wrong with me where they gave me painkillers. And then I was like, whoa, this is helping my PTSD, you know? So, but it was just like piling it in, you know? And me and my ex-wife were like, more he's arguing, uh, you don't care like, the things that normal people care about anymore. You just, they're complaining about bills or somebody talking something bad about them. You're like, dude, who cares? Like, you know, like, cause you see around the world what's going on. You're like, these people are like pooping in holes. You know what I mean? They're eating our garbage for like leftovers and we had to worry about dying every day. So it's kind of like shut you off, you know? So one day I just ended up exploding after about a year of being back and I ended up like, cursing my first sergeant out and whatnot, you know, I just had it. Like, I don't know why I had it, I just had it with everything. So um, I cursed him out and I said, get me out of the army, I don't care. You know, I was like, I'm not doing this no more. I was like, I'm taking pills to help me cope and whatnot. So they ended up uh, sending me to a rehab, which I went to, to get clean, and I did. And I still ended up getting out because I refused to do the extra duty because they try to get me with like, um, like double jeopardy, we call it, you know? Like they already punched me in one way for that and they were trying to get me again and I wasn't gonna settle for that. So they ended up getting me out and that was it. Like that was 2014. So I have a general, uh, I had a general under honorable conditions with patterns of misconduct, but then they up later upgraded, recognized those PTSD. So I have an honorable discharge, but with patterns of misconduct. And at that time, I still didn't believe in God, right? So I started losing everything, like my house, my career, my ex-wife. And I was just like, you know what? I made it to the highest level in my life. 
you know? So I was like, I was like, that's it. Once I run out of money, I'm going to end it. You know what I mean? Because I didn't believe in anything. And then like Bible Gateway kept popping up on YouTube video one day and kept popping up and popping up. I kept Xing it out, Xing it out. And then I came across like a video of a man like healing people and casting demons out in the name of Jesus in South Africa. And it had this prayer under it and I believed it. So I got on my knees and I accepted him right there. And that's when my life just changed slowly but surely started changing for the better, you know? Um, so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was volunteering in the church. Um, I went to college for like a semester, but I couldn't handle that because going from jumping out of airplanes, being shot at, to sitting down and reading for nine hours a day, I was like, this is not happening. So I got my VA benefits and I went to Puerto Rico. I was gonna go to South to Colombia because I like Spanish women. You know, that was my thing. And I kind of rebelled against God a little bit. So I was just like, I said, I can't do what the Bible says, you know? But my cousin's like, come to Puerto Rico, yo, you're gonna love it. He was married to a Puerto Rican woman. So I was like, all right, let me stop there. I went there, I was in a plan to go to Europe after, uh, during the summer, but I loved it. So I ended up learning to surf. That's all I did for the first year. Then I got a job uh, in the airport, Nagodi Airport, the second year. And then as everything was going smooth, um, Hurricane Maria hit. I was, on, I was there for Hurricane Maria. So devastated the island. Uh, there was no cell phones, no electricity, nothing like that for um, months, about two, three months. I worked. I was blessed because I worked in the airport, which I was able to get supplies. It was the biggest airport in Puerto Rico where they were flying all the cargo in to help the people. So I stayed there. The hurricane hit September 2017. I stayed there to January uh, for them to get everything up and running. And I wanted to stay there, but then I was like, oh man, I'm not going through a hurricane like this every 20 years. So I ended up coming back to the States. And then I ended up going, uh, staying with a friend who's a pastor. And now again, I was like, man, what do I want to do? So I chose like the quickest career I could find uh, with, a, with the lowest college degree. So I chose nursing. And plus it was like a 90% uh, workforce of women. So I thought that was good. And then um, I ended up getting into it for the wrong reason, not liking it. Um, like it felt it wasn't the right path for me. Then I went to college for psychology. Um, I didn't like that either. So I stopped before I even finished. Um, and I just said, screw it. I started traveling in the United States at that time um, with my dog to see what state I really wanted to go to, settle in and um, to find a, a place that I felt like I really wanted to be at for the rest of my life. And during that happening, uh, I went to Mexico, something happened, which I really don't want to talk about. So I came back and I was in Los Angeles at the time and my brother needed help. So I went back to North Carolina and I was going to start doing my real estate license. That's why I was like, all right, I'm going to do my real estate license make a bunch of money so I could travel full time, but in luxury, you know? Um, and that's when I heard the thing about Ukraine happening. And when that happened, I seen the president, well, first I prayed, I was like, cause I'm a warrior at heart, you know? I seen all those innocent people being killed, um, not for any political reasons or money or anything like that. I just, you know, they need to help with defense from what I seen as being a bully, you know? Um, but I didn't really know what was going on. I just seen the innocent people getting killed. So I prayed to God, if there's a way for me to go help, I'll go help. And then President Zelensky opened up the door for foreign professional fighters to come. And I applied to the Ukrainian embassy. They gave me approval. They seen my military record and history and, you know, the Purple Heart and the Army Commendation Medal with Valor. Um, so they approved me quick. So we had to pay to go there. We weren't expected to get paid or anything. I just expected them to give me supplies and food and hook me up with a team and then be like, go get them, you know? So that's what I was expecting, but it was different. It was more organized. So I go there uh, in, in the National Legion. Uh, a lot of people were going there for the wrong reasons or really weren't prior military, so to weed them out. Um, and you could tell, you know, who was lying about it and not. Uh, not everybody had proper documentation that was in the military. So once we weeded them out, 
uh, I was in a unit for a few weeks and I found out my mother was like really had cancer bad and she was dying. So basically we were like sitting ducks for a bit, you know, we're low in ammo, uh, a few dudes trying to hold a position, like sitting ducks waiting for the Russians to come. So I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna break out because the foreign fighter could break out of contract anytime. I'm gonna go see my mother and then probably come back. Um, or maybe not, I don't know. So, but COVID was happening. So New York was really strict. They wouldn't let me in. Um, so I already broke contract. By the time I got to Poland, my uncle was living there. Uh, I went to stop by and that's when my sister said, you, well, you can't see her anyway. So there's no point, you know? And I already gave up everything to go to Ukraine. So I was like, well, I might as well go back. And I went back to Ukraine. At that time, the Legion stopped recruiting people because they had too many people and they were trying to like make it more organized. So I just ended up getting an apartment in Kyiv for a bit. And there was a lot of airstrikes and whatnot, but I was used to it. When you have PTSD, you're more comfortable in a combat zone. It's relaxing to you. You're just like, you know, you expect it. So um, then they finally, a recruiter, who's my ex-girlfriend now, she put me into a, a special forces battalion with other really experienced uh, people from NATO forces. And our job was to operate behind enemy lines. And we had one mission where it was to find a route, go ahead of the Ukrainian army, find a route through all the artillery, um, through the minefields, um, where they could follow right behind us, and then pull security for them while they dig ditches to set up a new perimeter while pushing you know, the line forward. So as we move forward, you know, we meet them where they're at, the army, and then um, uh, our reconnaissance team and a couple of Ukrainian reconnaissance teams, we started, we had a drone fly over us for looking for mines, and we were getting bombed like crazy. Like, I got pictures of the field. Um, you could feel the ground just shake. You know, you just, only thing you could do is hope it doesn't hit you. So we found a place where we could go in between it, where they couldn't find us and the rest of the army. Um, and we found a spot. We heard the Russians speaking, the FOs, uh, on uh, headphones because they increase in volume. So it echoes, you know? And so we set up the perimeter. On our way back, we started exfilling, meaning we were leaving the scene. We did our job. And as we were leaving, the Russians spotted us, you know? They seen the bushes moving and whatnot. So they started firing at us. I believe they're like two, 250 meters away, something like that. Um, we couldn't see them, but we heard the gunshots, we heard the bullets, and, and then as we were getting shot at, this old, all right, so it was this old lady, but we didn't know at the time, she was walking down the road, she was like in her 80s, right, probably just trying to leave that village, um, and all you see is a person walking through the bushes, you know, with a canine next to her, so we're like, oh, this is a reconnaissance team probably from the Russians, so we all aimed, and something kept telling me, like, wait, wait, you know, I believe it was like God telling me, wait, wait, and I was waiting to see if there was gonna be more people. And then all of a sudden I see my commander through the bushes and I hear him talking in Ukrainian to them. Um, you, I don't understand the languages, but you could kind of distinguish between the dialects. So, and it turned out to be an old lady. So we grabbed her, threw her on our vehicle to get her out of there um, with like half the team. And my commander at the time, he's a Ukrainian commander, he pulled out thermal visions and he seen uh, where the Russians were firing at us from. I had a grenade launcher, so he told me and another guy to aim there. If they fire, blow them up. And he went over there, he told them to surrender. One big Russian dude surrendered and the rest I think fled. They were a forward observer team. So they go ahead of the rest of their unit to look for us so they could call in artillery strikes on us. Um, so we caught him and brought him back. So that was like the best mission we ever had. Um, nobody got killed. We didn't have to kill anybody and we got a prisoner, you know? So then like 18 hours later, we were supposed to be 24 hours off. We had another mission come on. I guess probably intel they got from that guy. They're like, this is, uh, this is when I got shot. I got shot with a 30 millimeter grenade launcher. Um, it didn't explode to make it short. The mission was to go into this village uh, that was occupied by Russians, sneak into a house, collect intel, and pick off small Russian teams. So as soon as we got there, um, they knew we were there. So it was like our five-man team and another Ukrainian team, and all hell broke loose. It was like a scene from like World War II. 
Uh, we were getting bombed, mortared, um, tank rounds, machine gun fire. And that was like maybe five minutes after getting out the vehicle because like a drone came over, they shot illumination rounds to light up the sky. And I knew because I was a mortarman what was coming next, uh, fire for effects, what it would just drop rounds on you. And it was so, like it was cold, it was so close you could feel the heat of the blast, like right on your butt. So the only thing I could think of was like, I was like, well, I'm gonna die anyway. So I rolled over to the dude next to me, I covered his body. And I remember I said to God, I was like, God, I don't wanna die right now, but if I die, let this man live, you know? And then like a break happened. They had a break in fire. They were on us, but they didn't know. So they shifted fire. And when you shift fire, um, there's like a 30 second to minute pause. And that gave us enough time to jump up and continue on, uh, on mission. So our commander yelled, go, go, get up, get up. I slapped the guy and I laughed at him. I was like, yo, we made it, you know? And uh, we kept going. And then we're coming up towards a crossroad. So we were coming up this way. It was a road this way. As I was walking past the road, I see either a mortar round or a tank round hit the house, maybe like 25 meters, 30 meters that way. And it lit up on fire. So the team stopped. Um, the Ukrainians were like towards my back right. I was more in the middle, right in the open road. My commander was in the front. He took cover by a house. Another dude was taking cover in the wood line. So I instantly thought, go to the house. But then I just seen that house get blown up. And I was like, that's not smart. Then I looked to the wood line and then I was, you're thinking really things really rapidly. Um, I was like, that's not smart. The minefields and we had no night vision on. And then as I was ready to move my next move, I looked to my right down the road. I see a door open and a dude fire his weapon. And I instantly knew. So like, a million things run through my mind. I instantly thought it was gonna hit in front of me and explode and we were done, you know? But then I just felt a punch in the side and I had no side plates in, so the round didn't explode. If it would have hit the side plates, well, it was less than hundred meters. So our rounds, they take over hundred meters or 70 meters to activate, so many spins. Um, so it may have not activated, but it hit just below my rib line. And when it went in, I didn't know what happened, it just boom, but I knew it went into me. Um, so I just, I like, I remember shaking, my knees were wobbling and I took a deep breath to scream, I'm hit, I'm hit. And I hit to the ground on my knees and I fell backwards because of the big backpack I had on. And I remember it so distinctively, like clear as day, like, you know, like the night sky kept lighting up from all the rounds exploding around us. Um, when I said hit, two guys uh, came to me and I remember hearing them saying, how was he hit? Because there was no explosion yet. Like I got hit in between the explosions. And if you get hit by shrapnel, it's usually right away. So two dudes stayed with me and they told the commander we're not leaving him because uh, he told them to take cover before they treated me, which is correct because you're supposed to have fire superiority. And we had no medics with us. We were on, you know, fixing ourselves basically. So they stayed with me and I was screaming to God. I was praying. I was like, I was like, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I forgive everybody. I said, I'm ready. I did enough on this earth. I was like, take me home, you know, screaming in pain because the pain was so unbearable. So it's like the round burns at over 2000 degrees, right? So it's like someone taking a hot, uh, a hot cast iron pan and putting it in your stomach. My insides were cooking um, from the round, but it was cauterizing my wound because the hole was like 30 millimeters. So it was like that. Um, and it stopped right here. So my organs stopped it, it act as a cushion. Um, it hit my liver. It was a part. My large intestine was smashed and burnt. My gallbladder was destroyed. My abdominals were destroyed. Um, my small intestine was burnt and I had metal in my right lung. So I was jacked up and I was just praying to God to take me. Um, and the explosions kept happening while they were working on me. There was no morphine, so I was screaming for morphine. Um, they, I felt something hit my leg, but I don't know what it was. But whatever it was, it didn't work. So then they threw me on the vehicle we came in, which is a BTR, uh, like a basic troop transport, armored vehicle. And I was in so much pain screaming. I remember trying to hit the wall to break my hand so I could feel pain somewhere else. Because it was like just a fire unleashed in my stomach and I couldn't escape. 
and the Ukrainians that were looking, I think they were recording with their phone, and I heard one say in his accent, like, ooh, I never seen so much blood, you know? And I was like, yeah, thanks, you know, like, that helps. Yelling, and then I screamed Jesus' name so loud, I wanted to make sure God looked from his throne in heaven and seen me in pain, you know? So, and then I was just like, take me, take me, take me now, it hurts too bad, and I seen the wrist of my, uh, the band that my ex-girlfriend gave me at the time. Um, so, and then I remembered that I told her I'll get back to her no matter what. And I was like, God, wait, 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 wait. Don't answer that prayer. Give me more time. Give me more time. I was like, but make me pass out. Please make me pass out. You know, um, I couldn't pass out. So they said transport time was like between two to three hours. I couldn't keep track, but cause I was in so much pain. Then they finally threw me into the ambulance and then they gave me some morphine, which didn't work. I was still in pain. And then I started throwing up blood everywhere because um, there was a hole in my stomach, blood in my lung. And I was like, oh man, I'm really jacked up. So I make it to the hospital. And I remember screaming to the surgeons, I made it, now put me to sleep, this shit hurts, you know? <laughs> and uh, they were just looking at me stunned because they knew that someone was hit with a grenade launcher, but they couldn't believe I made it, you know? Because normally uh, it didn't explode, right? It didn't explode. But no normally they would. Yeah, if it hits something hard, and if it, it's usually over a certain distance. But I think because I was so close. It hit your body and... Yeah, I don't know how the Russians uh, round works, but it needs so many rotations to actually uh, activate, uh, to become a live explosive. You get lucky round. and unlucky. Yeah. So I made it to the hospital. They put me to sleep. And that's the photo I showed you um, with the hole in my body and the cross. You could tell from the cross that it's me. Um, after they cleaned me up, they sent that to my ex-girlfriend. Um, so they put me to sleep and then I woke up, I was alone. And the first thing I thought was like, was that a dream? Was that a nightmare? I kept trying to sit up and I couldn't. They had me like taped down because they didn't want me to move because it's explosive in my stomach. Um, and they kept me separate from everyone else in critical while they were planning my surgery. So I asked the doctor if I could get the phone to call uh, who was my girlfriend at the time. Uh, Cause I gave her my word if I woke up in the hospital, I'll call her, so I did. And she FaceTimed me and I showed her. And then she told me kind of what was happening to keep me separate, uh, you know, to plan on how to take it out and whatnot. And I was like, all right. And then I remember the nurse took the phone and then I was like, oh, I wanted to make sure, I'm pretty sure every dude does this. I was like, nurse, is it still there, you know? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, it's still there. I was like, all right. I was like, can you put me back to sleep? And she's like, yeah, yeah. And she put me back to sleep. And then they woke me up before surgery. And then I was like, I don't care, just put me back to sleep, you know? So they put me back to sleep. And they said it only took like six, seven hours. They had like 40 people working on me. Um, from what I was told from my ex-girlfriend, what she was telling me, and others uh, who there. So I remember waking up and I just had holes in me. I had two holes. Uh, this was cut open and my intestine was out, you know, because I didn't know what happened at the time. I was explaining this after. And then I remember thinking, I was asking them, I was like, where, where's the metal that's in me? Where's the round? Where's the round? I want it, you know? I was like, I survived it. I want it. They're like, they had to get rid of it. They had engineers outside your surgery room and they took it. Um, so I was like, all right. And I couldn't sleep. I was in so much pain. It was like, I thought getting shot hurt, recovery was even worse. I was struggling to breathe. And I remember the way the nurses were looking at me while I was in critical, like I wasn't gonna make it. Like they'll give me a face, like I wasn't gonna make it. And I kept seeing pastors and priests come in to the other guys that were dying. And then I just said, I was like, God, I know you didn't put me through all that pain just to die now. And what kept going through my mind was blood flow equals healing, blood flow equals healing. So I was on orders not to move, but my feet were turning blue. I was struggling to breathe. They went and propped me up. I was on probably enough painkillers, probably kill an elephant, you know? Um, they had a direct IV hooked up into my chest because those third degree burns on my organs. Um, so I took a deep breath one morning. I was like, f it was four days after I was hit. I got up and I started walking and it was like the strength of the Lord just strengthened me. And I took like, three steps, you know? I had like all these holes in me and like four tubes coming out of my body. And I screamed and I was like, I demand to walk and I demand some food, you know? I didn't know my digestive system was shut off completely. So the doctors, their mouths just dropped, you know? And 
They checked me. They never gave me an x-ray. They checked me with a sonogram. That's how they did the surgery. And they checked me again to make sure I didn't rip anything and everything was fine. So they moved me. They gave me permission to walk after that. And they, they started giving me yogurt because um, my mouth was dry, completely dried out. Um, and then they transported me from one city to another. And that's where I met up with my ex. And that's when more healing started happening. So my friend almost died in Afghanistan. Um, the doctor said you have to be in the hospital six months to a year, what they were telling me. Um, and I was like, so I, he believes in Jesus a lot too. And he said, God healed him in like 30 days. He had a huge testimony. So I, I texted him, I was like, yo, what did you pray to God to get healed that quick, you know? So he kind of coached me up on it. He's like, no matter what people tell you, no matter what your body's saying, keep thanking God to heal uh, for your healing. So he's like, but you have to agree that you're not going to fight on the front lines no more. And that's exactly what I did. I was like, Lord, I won't fight no more. Um, I didn't really want to fight because of all the pain I was feeling anyway. I was like, at least for this war, you know, I won't fight in this war no more. And I kept, I remember every day I kept walking with all these holes in me. And no matter what they were telling me, you know, you're going to be in the hospital for this long. I was like, nope. I was like, you don't know who my God is. Jesus Christ is my God. I'm going to I'm going to heal quicker. And less than six weeks, I was being discharged in the, from the hospital. Wow. My lung was completely healed. My liver was completely healed. Uh, my intestines, they said, were still healing. Um, so they discharged me with the intestine out. And um, so I got hit November 5th, 2022. I was being discharged early second week of December 2022. And then I had to go back in February to... Uh, to get another surgery. They wanted to send me to Poland and NATO forces because the embassy was putting pressure on them. I didn't want to go because I had an apartment at the time and a girlfriend I wanted to get back to at the time, you know, and they kind of lied to me to get me out there. I think they will. They said, well, we'll get you, you know, your intestine put back in in three weeks. And I was like, all right. So I went there and then they said, no, it's two months. I said, well, I'm not staying here. I'm out. I'm going back to Ukraine to my apartment, you know? So that's what I did. And then the Ukrainians, uh, a private facility gave me a free surgery. That was my fifth surgery. And then it got infected, so they had to give me another surgery to fix the infection, and that was it. After that, when they released those stitches, the first thing I started doing was burpees to get back into shape, and uh, which wasn't smart. I was supposed to wait like two months, but I didn't listen, so I did it, and I got a little bit of a hernia from that, but I wanted to get back into shape, and I was gonna stay there to train uh, the f new fighters were uh, coming in. That was, I said, I can't fight. I told God I wouldn't fight no more. He trumps you. That's it, you know? Because um, most guys that would go into the units, they have a lot of experience, but some of them haven't touched a weapon in five years. And it's a perishable skill. So if you don't practice, you know, you need the reflexes to come back. So I was like, I'll train them. It was, the cycle was two months on, uh, two weeks on vacation, two weeks training. And by that time, you know, the average death rate on that, in that unit or uh, severely wounded rate was by like the third mission, you know? I got shot on the second mission. I met another kid from UK who lost both his legs on the third mission, you know? There was another guy who got his leg taken off by a tank. Um, he was only on like the second mission. So, because all these missions were like behind enemy lines. Do you think you were born to be a soldier when you were a boy? Um, you were into it when you were a kid, right? Yeah. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I was playing a lot of war games growing up. Um, so I was always into fitness and uh, doing that. I always remember thinking I was either gonna become like a cop, a firefighter, or a soldier. There's, some, there's something in a boy's or a man's yeah. DNA that makes us wanna fight, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I did. I mean, also too, it's kind of like not everybody could react the same way in such a hostile environment. So when everything's normal, I feel weird, right? I don't feel like it's normal. <laughs> but when everything's going chaotic, it's like everything slows down for me and I automatically know what to do. Um, it's weird. So a lot of guys have similar gifts like that, but you could also see the guys who don't. And they're the ones that usually freak out, you know? Um, it takes training, but I also believe it's partially a gift too. Uh, to be able to have that mindset. Yeah, not, not everyone is cut out to be a soldier. Yeah. Also, there's like same thing with rescue workers. They they have the same kind of mindset or, uh, you know, 
CEOs too, usually, because companies like all doing all this stuff, they just know what to do, right? So everything slows down, I guess to put it like that. It's like adrenaline pumps and I could control it when it's like that. And it's weird. It's like you just know what to do, you know? So, or unless it's like God's angel saying, hey, do this, you know? So real, you're probably like, yo, you're about to get shot at, go run there. <laughs> I don't know, but um, I enjoyed it. I don't regret it at all because we get to save lives. So uh, even saving that old lady the day before, it was worth it, you know? Because I was asking myself that on the hospital bed every day. I was just like, man, was it worth all this pain, you know? I was like, well, I got to save one life, you know? And at least probably my teams because it hit me and didn't explode. So I was like, it's worth it. Um, and it was grueling, the pain. At the time, I was like, I wouldn't ever want to do it again. But my ex was right. She said something to me. She's like, watch, when you heal up, you're going to want to go back out. It's in your blood. And she was right, you know? So I still think about it, but I can't because I gave God my word. So I'm not going to go against him, you know, or he might remove his protection off me. <laughs> anyway. Okay, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story. No problem. I'm Have a great you, day. I'm glad you made it. Thanks. Thanks, sir.